Yeah, what up? Uh, I've been accused of being pro-vivisection by many, many people. It amuses me somewhat that this was a central part of Durian Rider's uh, defamation against me. In several of his videos, he would sort of make the, the baseline element of his attack against me the claim that uh, I was pro-vivisection, and then he would proceed to build on this series of lies. He would lie about the order of events, claiming that I initiated violence against him when the exact opposite is true. He made threats of violence against me, and then I had to deal with it. He would lie about uh, just things he made up out of thin air, claiming that I was a wife beater, claiming that I needed to provide legal proof that I was not a wife beater. Although, amusingly, by complete coincidence, I actually did provide him with a current criminal record check from Canada that related to the job I had lined up in China. I needed criminal background check to get that job, so I did actually have a fresh criminal record check, <laughs> which didn't interest him. You'll be shocked to know he was not interested in the facts. But it's always been a sort of interesting leitmotif among my stupidest and most extreme critics that they want to claim again and again that I am pro-vivisection. Now, a small number of people see those, frankly, defamatory attacks against me. It is defamation, definitely under Canadian law, to say that I'm pro-vivisection. In American court, it probably would be, but not really worth talking about here. Um, it is actually defamatory to say that I'm pro-vivisection. If you go to my YouTube channel and you search for the word vivisection, there are three videos that have vivisection in the title. These are not the only videos in which I discuss the issue, the politics of animals being exploited in laboratories. The one video I would recommend most, actually, does not have vivisection in the title. Those are all good videos, too, don't get me wrong. There's a recent video called Vegans vs. the Wildlife Management Paradigm, and I will give you the link to that. So as that title suggests, there the main topic being dealt with is wildlife management and the question of how we think about um, domesticated animals in contrast to wild animals, etc. However, in the midst of that video, you do get a rapid and somewhat emotional, uh, emotionally charged rundown of what my views are on vivisection and how ridiculous the response of the vegan community has been. I make contrasts there that I've made throughout my career on YouTube, throughout my couple of years here making videos on YouTube. I often make comparisons to how we've quit smoking as a society, the movement towards the abolition of cigarettes being something very different from the abolition of slavery, uh, being something very different from the United States Civil War, a war that was fought over the abolition of slavery. People like to compare things to the abolition of slavery, often omit the, the fact that there was a war involved, talking about American slavery. You can talk about slavery in Sri Lanka, you can talk about slavery in ancient Egypt or ancient Greece. You can say a lot about slavery, but, you know, all comparisons are odious, and the comparison to slavery is in some ways especially odious and prob problematic. But the comparison to abolition within the United States tends to overlook tends to overlook the Civil War. People want to say that somehow the future of veganism is going to be like the history of how slavery was abolished. Um, but outstanding in, in the videos that are up, you know, um, there's one video only 11 minutes long, vivisection and insider's perspective. I have actually spoken to some scientists involved in research that exploits animals, whether it's vivisection technically or not, um, who are vegan, who are vegan, who are pro-vegan but who do regard what they're doing in the sciences as medically necessary, as beneficial to planet Earth, as making the world a better place, etc. Now, what I want to ask in this video, in contrast to the hyperbolic denunciation and defamation of me as someone who is pro-vivisection, <laughs> There's a small number of intelligent people who've heard those accusations, who've looked at what I say about vivisection, and right away they figure out that I am not pro-vivisection. I would love to abolish vivisection. However, like the abolition of cigarettes, it's going to be a long process. Unlike cigarettes, unlike the wearing of leather, the people who are engaged in vivisection, in animal research, in the exploitation of animals in laboratories, genuinely believe they're making the world a better place. Rightly or wrongly. And some of them are right some of the time, some of them are wrong some of the time, etc. But if you walk down the street and you decide to verbally insult... <laughs> I was going to use another verb. Let's stay with insult. If you as a vegan decide to walk down the street and start insulting people who wear leather, because, you know, we regard this as immoral... Do you think you're going to run into even a single person wearing leather who would tell you, hey, I'm wearing this leather jacket because I'm trying to find the cure for cancer? 
Do you think you'd talk to a woman wearing high leather boots who would tell you, hey, by wearing these leather boots, I'm making the world a better place? I'm, I'm wearing these leather boots for the children, for the future. I'm wearing these leather boots to produce vaccines, medicines, cures for terminal illnesses. Uh, hey, if, you're, if your grandmother needed these leather boots to save her life, would you refuse her the right to wear these leather boots because they're not vegan? The level of hostility that vegans have towards the use of animals in medical research, the use of animals not just in researching medicines but actually producing medicines, is surreal. Now, as I said in the earlier video, I have my own sentiments on this matter. I, you, there's an issue of passion over reason here. In the video, I'll, I'll link below um, with wildlife in the title. I say passionately, look, when I see photographs of even the horseshoe crab being in a laboratory, being exploited, being killed slowly to, to produce medicines that we have no other way to produce. It's deeply horrifying to me. Um, you know, and even in my more sort of moderate videos where I'm talking about the pros and cons of these issues in a modern way, you'll notice I use words like, you know, abomination. I, I, I do not refer to the torturing of animals in laboratories in a value-neutral way. I, I refer to it as something... Um, deeply disturbing, immoral, etc. to me. However, we have to be able to recognize that this is, this is not something merely motivated by greed, the way that perhaps slavery was. Obviously, that's a simplification. Um, it's not merely motivated by speciesism in, in a parallel to racism. It's not merely motivated by vanity in the way that wearing leather is. And it's definitely not motivated by addiction in the way that smoking cigarettes is. And, you know, as a society, we've failed to get rid of cigarette smoking, even though nobody's smoking cigarettes in order to cure cancer. So, you know, it, it is a bit bizarre. But the question is, what does it mean to be anti-vivisection in veganism in the 21st century? Some of you who are older will know immediately what it is I'm about to be warning about in this video. Some of you who are younger will not understand at all what it is implicitly that people like Durian Ryder are alluding to and getting at when they denounce me in claiming that I'm, that I'm pro-vivisection because I'm willing to take a sort of nuanced and complex view of these issues. I have one video called Vivisection in the Next 10 Years where I'm asking, look, it's easy for us to make extreme statements about how we want to get rid of all the laboratories, we want to get rid of all the cages. Okay, how long are you going to live? What's going to happen in the next 10 years? What's going to happen in the next 30 years? Can we ever get down to brass tacks? Can we ever get down to pragmatic, you know, models of activism, of engagement, of making the world a better place? Because I don't really want to hear it, to be honest with you. I don't want to hear about how you're going to liberate all the animals in labs. Because for one thing, it's bullshit. It's a hollow post. It's just macho posturing on your part. And on the other hand, I'm actually interested in, as I said in an earlier video, I'm interested in winning. I'm interested in setting up political struggles that I can win that can actually end in a victory, such as passing a law, passing a regulation, creating a standard. Yes, public education, changing the culture, those things are important too. We're talking about vivisection, ultimately we're talking about government regulation, period. We are. Government regulation of labs, etc. And again, keep digressing. I have my own biases in this. In terms of how academic research works, I have many, many experiences, even outside of academia, even for-profit research, the way in which proposals are written, I'm very much aware that while some percentage of exploitation of animals, some percentage of vivisection can be justified in terms of the ends justifying the means or simply the total impossibility of finding a better substitute. You know, in some cases, there's a, there's a non-animal non-animal killing way to, to do the same work, to do the same lab, or to get the same chemicals, but in some cases there are not. So I mentioned earlier, as horrifying as the horseshoe crab example is, right now medical science has no known substitute for it, etc. Under the European Union guidelines, all labs are supposed to look for uh, alternatives. They're supposed to prove that they've exhausted the possibility of using any better alternative before they can torture animals. Of course, it's questionable whether or not that actually happens, blah, blah, blah. And there's also been a, a movement in medical science, last 10, 15 years, somewhat disturbing, but we're thinking about as vegans, um, there's been a move, especially in Europe, to try to use lower orders of animals, already a human-centered uh, notion, but instead of torturing monkeys to death, to ask, well, can we do the same lab work using shellfish? Can we instead torture some, some clams to death? 
um, this kind of thing. Now, this also, when you actually start doing some research about it, doing some thinking about it, the, the old-fashioned, all animals are equal, species is few of the world, becomes very difficult to maintain. Do you actually think that a mouse is equal to a monkey? Do you actually think that shellfish are equal to rabbits? Uh, this leads you down the path of ethical questions that are very difficult to answer. And extremists, almost by definition, want to give you simple answers to complicated questions. Obviously, a complete imbecile like Durian Rider just wants to defame me by saying that I'm pro-vivisection. Anyone who takes the time to, to Google check that, to come to my YouTube channel, put in the word vivisection, is going to find that, no, I do want to end vivisection. I would love to, but I'm willing to admit that this is a much, much more difficult, uh, nuanced, self-contradictory situation that vegans are drawn into than, for example, how do we abolish leather? Leather should be the simplest thing for us to abolish. And our attitudes towards people who wear leather may be completely contemptuous because leather offers no benefit in the sense that medical research does. Leather offers no benefit in the sense that um, the production of vaccines or medicines based on, on exploitation of animals does. And yet, do we have any great success to show in our attempts to abolish leather? You tell me, why don't you name one country in the world where leather is illegal or where governments even have laws in place to gradually phase out the use of leather in the same sense that we're trying to phase out the use of nicotine, the use of tobacco, the use of cigarettes. Any takers? Okay, not even India, not even Taiwan, not even the countries that have the, the strongest uh, vegan movements, vegan communities, not even the countries that have the largest percentages of vegans, it's certainly not Israel, right? And we can. Leather, we can get rid of leather tomorrow. Leather is perfectly substitutable. There are other things we can substitute for leather instantly with no loss to ourselves. Okay, what does it mean when my fellow vegans denounce me as being pro-vivisection? I think actually it's tremendously disturbing for the future of this movement. Let's take a look at the guy called Steve Best. Professor Stephen Best. He used to be a famous name in uh, veganism, animal rights, etc., I think his web presence has gone pretty much silent since 2014. His blog hasn't been updated, etc. I think it started to go silent at the end of 2012 when he ran into a little bit of trouble. I'm going to read from an article providing the link below uh, from a science blog called Respectful Insolence. It is an anonymously written blog. The guy's, the guy's handle is ORAC. It's a fake name, obviously. So this is written from a scientist's perspective, a scientist who supports vivisection, the exploitation of animals in the pursuit of scientific knowledge, new medicines, etc. I begin, quote, It's no secret that I have little but contempt for radical animal rights activists. I make no apologies for this and, quite frankly, consider my contempt for them well justified based on their behavior and words. Be it their fetishization of violence against researchers. There you go. I couldn't quite get that word out. Don't have a lot of practice saying that word. <laughs> uh, their fetishization of violence against researchers who use animals, their threatening of students in order to frighten them away from careers in scientific research that might involve the use of animals, for example, Alina Rodriguez, intimidating research by declaring their children not off limits, so not just making threats of violence against the professors, but the children of the professors, um, trying to burn investigators' houses down, harassing researchers and, in general, behaving like criminals in their quest to stop all animal research, period. Uh, close quote for a second. I just note there are links within the text I've just read. If you guys want, you can read along. You can click below and see the text. These are specific examples. So he is not just vaguely saying that animal rights activists have tried to burn people's houses down or tried to harass people or threaten people's children. He does have links to examples throughout the whole article. I continue to read. Um... <clears throat> Indeed, most recently, I couldn't help but feel the most satisfying sense of schadenfreude uh, when Camille Marino, head loon at the animal rights blog Negotiation is Over, dot net, was finally jailed for her activities. Overall, NIO, NIO, Negotiation is Over, is a group that cleverly doesn't explicitly advocate violence, but makes threats and tries its best to intimidate. Other luminaries in the animal rights movement include Jerry Vlasek, who, embarrassingly to me, is a surgeon who is known for his justifications for murdering researchers. Again, there's a link. 
Basically, from my perspective, he eggs on younger, more easily malleable members of the movement with flaming screeds of hate-filled rhetoric, while he maintains plausible deniability for his involvement in any crimes they might commit. Then there's Stephen Best, whose recent activities have revealed what a despicable piece of work he is, uh, particularly his hypocrisy. Stephen Best is a tenured professor of philosophy at the University of Texas, El Paso, known for his incendiary rhetoric, for example, about how he wants to make his enemies feel the fear. There's then a link to a YouTube video. The YouTube video is on Stephen Best's own YouTube channels. This was not someone exposing him. This was He posted this himself. He recorded this. He was proud of this. He shared this. He posted this himself. That YouTube video is, con is titled, Dr. Stephen Best, colon, Every swear word who hurts animals is going to feel the fear. And it is, indeed, um, whether you call that endorsing terrorism or what, um, the meaning of that is very clear. So I'm going to, I'm, obviously I'm not reading right now, I'm pausing from the article. I'm going to note, I myself have spent enough time in universities talking to career professors about uh, vivisection, that these are issues that touch my life in a way that it may not touch all of yours. I have spoken repeatedly to professors of Buddhism, professors of Buddhist philosophy, about why they didn't lift a finger about animal rights on campus, about the questions of basically how the exploitation of animals uh, in laboratories on their own campus is governed. That includes, you know, the famous professor emeritus Richard Gombrich. I've spoken to both Buddhist professors who are famous and not famous, at universities that were famous and universities that were not famous. Gombrich is at Oxford, England. Uh, one very memorable example was actually a university and hospital in Taiwan. Fam they're famous to me. They're famous if you care about Buddhism. Uh, this is in Hualien, Taiwan. They have both a university and a, a hospital that are obviously paid for ultimately by donations from, from Buddhist, Buddhist people. And yet at this Buddhist hospital where they're, you know, they're literally, they're paintings of the Buddha up, all the food, I think, is vegan. It's at least vegetarian. Maybe they have some dairy on, on the hospital. But, you know, the, the hospital food is, in principle, vegan or vegetarian. They're a, in terms of their ethics, they're supposedly a Buddhist organization. And yet, nevertheless, they had vivisection of animals. They had animal exploiting, animal killing research on that university campus, on that uh, medical campus on that on that university property to me that's baffling i did talk to people about it and uh i and my my wife who's now my ex-wife i'm divorced in case you hadn't heard my ex-wife looked into articles on it, articles that had quotations and interviews with the professors so you can be in some especially bizarre situations in trying to address these questions of the ethics of animal research and exploitation within universities and i myself have done more of that than the average vegan because of the peculiar life I've lived in both being engaged with many, many universities, talking to so many professors and so many campuses, and because I was engaged with Buddhist philosophy, where it seems to me it's a no-brainer. If you're a professor of Buddhist philosophy who talks about the importance of not killing a mosquito, you know, you may actually have a lecture uh, about the philosophy of not killing insects in Buddhism. It's a big deal in Buddhism. Uh, when I was a practicing Buddhist, I tried very hard to avoid killing uh, insects, to avoid killing cockroaches, and when I stopped being a Buddhist, I changed. <laughs> I lost my faith. You can see earlier YouTube videos on that too. <laughs> um, but yeah, I can remember working very hard to scoop out a cockroach and keep it alive and set it free. That was inside my suitcase when I was in northern Laos in Southeast Asia. Used to really try my best. Some, sometimes the cockroaches would end up getting killed anyway, but it was, it was a struggle. Being vegan is still a struggle, but... I don't, I don't kid myself with that stuff anymore. Um, I've had to deal with mosquitoes. I've had to deal with bed bugs. Real people do real things, and sometimes there's a real body count, especially in, uh, in insect lives. And the production of all fruit and vegetables kills insects. Pr production of all grains kills insects. And again, I have made videos in the past about this in contrast to some of the extreme rhetoric that vegans offer. Um, but we continue. My, my point is here... Stephen Best, although as you're about to hear, he does do unethical and illegal things. Basically, what he is trying to do is radicalize and reform university campuses in reference to uh, vivisection, exploitation of animals. So it's kind of a movement within universities. But what I ask you, I'll just set this up now and keep reading. Do you really think that the effect of this type of intimidating, violent, anti-vivisection activism, do you really think it impairs scientific research. You really think it makes universities consider, oh gee, we better get rid of 
these people doing, for example, original research on cancer, cancer therapy? Or do you think it makes the universities want to get rid of people like Stephen Vest? Does it make universities think, forget it, we don't want to have a course on animal rights. We don't want to employ a professor, a career academic, talking about um, veganism, animal exploitation, future... No. What do you think the real impact is? There is a much bigger impact on us, on vegans. Very real within academia. I mean, you know, in society as a whole, this also makes us look like lunatics. But within academia, very rapidly, that's going to create a chill where people say, look, you can't give a tenured academic post to some guy who lectures about veganism and animal rights. Forget it. You can't give a, a, a position in a university to someone who cares passionately about ecology and who sees veganism as one aspect of ecological progress or even legal and moral progress. You can't do that. It'll be a disaster. Just look at this guy, Stephen Best. Just look at these legal cases attached to him. Just look at... That's a big chill. That's a major chilling effect. Um... The impact for the cancer research, if they're doing anything like legitimate research, it's not. It's not a chill that way. And I'm sorry, I have so much to say about this. I have read, of course, examples of, again, I don't want to say all this stuff so much because I have earlier videos on the topic. I have read examples of uh, animal exploiting research that could not have possibly discovered anything legitimate, where the nature of the research proposal to begin with was deeply flawed, the way the lab report was structured was deeply flawed, where they were really killing animals for no reason. That's a huge ethical issue. And the question of how we can prevent that, you know, before the lab takes place or before the funding is granted or what have you, I think is a tremendous question for political science. Um, and I myself have been involved in projects, not, none of them involving sci scientific research in this sense. You know, I'm in the social sciences, political science, social, researching social problems, etc., um, but there are situations where research I've done, both uh, private sector and academic, what have you, you're sitting around with people, and it's like, oh, great, you know, we have to get we have to get eight funding proposals written by the deadline, and the deadline is on Tuesday. So we have, like, two proposals that are really good, but we're afraid we won't get the funding to do this research. So quick, we have only a couple days. Let's come up with six new research proposals. That's one of the reasons why some of these, some of these labs are so ridiculous. Sometimes just to keep up their budget, just to keep the, the program rolling, uh, you know, people, I remember one project I was on, I was asking, you know, people higher up, why is the proposal so bad? Why is the research proposal so, so irrelevant to the project? And someone took me aside and admitted to me, they only had a couple of hours to write this research proposal. Again, some deadline, you know, putting in a bid to get research funding. So they took a proposal for a totally different project, deleted a few of the keywords, replaced them with other keywords, and then you know, put this in before the deadline. I've, I've seen stuff that all the time. When I was at Cambridge University, I remember me and my wife, now my ex-wife talking to this one guy, he didn't realize the deadline for research uh, research proposals for a specific uh, type of research was that day. So he had like two hours to come up with a proposal. We verbally were giving him advice and then he went away and did the paperwork and so on. He got the money too. You know, the real world of academic research funding proposals, the structure of how projects are selected and approved is something I do have personal experience with, even though I'm not at all in the medical, uh, not pure medical sciences or anything like that. I'm not, not involved in anything that ever involved torturing animals to death. But it is very easy for me to imagine how it is that terrible projects that exploit animals for no reason do get money and do end up killing animals again and again. You can find myriad examples of that. However, as, as easy as it would be for me to believe, as politically convenient as it would be for me to believe or pretend that absolutely 100% of animal research is, in that sense, exploiting animals for no good reason, have no meaningful findings, are not producing medicines, it would be the most convenient thing in the world for me to adopt that posture and tell you this is 100% um, redundant. This is 100% useless, meaningless. These animals are being tortured for no reason. The way that the production of leather is 100% obsolete and redundant. I would love to be able to say that to you, but that would be a lie. And I am not here to preach a religion that's based on a lie. I'm not here to support a political movement that's based on a lie. I'm interested in the truth, even if that truth is complex and self-contradictory. All right, we continue. Quote, Steve Best was also co-founder of the North American Animal Liberation Press Office and is widely known for his endorsement of violence as legitimate, even preferred methods, method of achieving total animal liberation. 
The concept behind his views is extensional self-defense, whereby Best and his fellow travelers have decided they are completely justified in using violence to achieve their aims, or preferably in inducing various dupes to commit whatever crime it takes to stop animal research. Close quote. I just note in Stephen Best's defense, he claims that he only supports crimes against property, not crimes against people. That is debatable. I have an earlier video also in which I directly skewer this idea that you can separate crimes against property from crimes against people. Uh, you can see my critique of Gary, pardon me, Gary Yurovsky on that, talking about animal liberation front, and I have at least one video also talking about Stephen Best directly. So uh, Best does have a counter argument to these points. I personally do not find that counter argument convincing, and this scientist is obviously summing it up from his. Uh, He's summing it up from his perspective, which is, of course, unflattering to Steve Best. I continue to read, quote, Consistent with the concept of extensional self-defense and speeches like the one above, Best used to be affiliated with NIO in a big way, being a frequent contributor to its blog as recently as last year and having apparently actively assisted Marino and her wandering band of animal rights thugs in a more material way, as described at Death and Taxes last year. So again, there's a link these are all variously links to audio recordings, articles, YouTube videos, etc. throughout the article. I continue. Basically, Best appears to have allowed NIO to use one of his PayPal accounts to collect donations to be used as a bounty for snitches willing to provide the addresses, phone numbers, and personal information of students and professors whose research used animals, whom NIO would target for harassment. Marino and Best seem to be the best of buddies, comrades in arms, in the eternal struggle to harass and frighten vivisectors until they gave up animal research, etc. Close quote. Um, you see, you tell me, why, why would this be justifiable for vegans when they're harassing, threatening, and intimidating scientists, research scientists, at their homes, research scientists and their children, apparently, at their homes, um... When those research scientists believe, rightly or wrongly, they're finding the cure to cancer, they're making the world a better place, they're supporting the progress of science, why, why is it that uh, vegans would not do this against someone who simply chooses to wear leather? Leather isn't going to find the cure for cancer. Leather isn't going to make the world a better place. This is obviously just a ludicrous, radical power trip, you know, based on the idea that these people can become legends, legends in their own mind, can become influential and important, you know, by using these immoral, unethical, unsympathetic, dead-ended tactics that, you know, will make it impossible for you to ever advocate for real legal reform and social change. You know, you're destroying your own opportunity to participate in electoral democracy. You're destroying the opportunity to make real political change and embracing phony political change that totally discredits you and discredits me also, discredits all of us, discredits all vegans. It's a terrible uh, negative side effects of everything. But, you know, look, you're not living in Egypt. You're not living in China. This is in the United States of America. And Steve Best, you have the easiest life imaginable. You're paid to grade papers in university. You, you have a home. You have stability. You have a steady income as a tenured professor. And this is the best way you can think of to make a better place, you want to pay people to, to snitch on where research scientists' homes are so you can go there and threaten them. And I, it's sickening. It's sickening and it's stupid and it's counterproductive. And if, if this is what it means to be anti-vivisection, I'm, as I've said, I am not pro-vivisection. But all you guys, if anyone is stupid enough to believe Durian Ryder when he says that I'm pro-vivisection, you take a good hard look at who it is in the vegan movement who identifies as anti vivisection You take a look at what that really means. What it means right now. This, this article is 2012. Okay, there's a huge shadow hanging over us. And if your whole life is on YouTube, if you don't deal with real world animal rights conferences, animal rights activists, you may not be aware of it. You may not have had to deal with it. But yes, there's a huge shadow hanging over us that stems from, from people like this from the legacy of this this kind of activism, this type of overtly criminal, overtly violent activism. Anyway, th this article continues. I, I won't read it all. So, quote, Not anymore, it would appear. Late last month, in a delicious twist of fate, Stephen Best and Camille Marino had a bit of a falling out. 
the entertainingly ironic thing about this whole kerfuffle between the two is that when his own preferred in methods of intimidation and threats were turned against him, suddenly Best's bravado and rhetoric were no longer quite so bold. Suddenly his proclamations of having no fear were not quite so full-throated. In fact, they were non-existent. Whereas Best is known for encouraging violent action on his website, publishing on his website the names, photos, and addresses of the scientists he targets, and speaking internationally about his justifications for extremism up to and including violence in the service of animal rights activism, when such tactics were turned against him, he did not like it, not one little bit. So there are quotations here pertaining to, I'm pausing the article, I'm going to skip some stuff, uh, pertaining to a restraining order that Steve Best then had issued against some of his fellow animal rights activists, some of the people who had been his colleagues in his overtly violent form of activism when there was some dispute and they turned on him he did indeed run to the cops to try to get uh, protection now look, again my research on politics is relevant to this my experience at the university is relevant to this but also my, my research related to cults you know religious phenomena religious cults um, very often when people start a cult what they're doing whether or not they realize it is creating a crossroads that attracts a certain type of person um, <laughs> it's like, you know, if, you, if you're trying to recruit the most violent members of other biker gangs to start your own biker gang, that's openly what you're trying to do. You don't want average members of, of biker gangs. You want the most violent members of biker gangs. Um, guess what kind of problems you have, including problems of people questioning your leadership. Like, so, you know, Steve Best gets questioned by people who he has himself been leading, but... They're people who, you know, he chose them and they chose him because they wanted to be part of the most extreme, most violent aspect of animal rights activism. They wanted to be in this very uncompromising and extreme milieu. So, you know, you, you create a crossroads to attract and reward the attention of a certain type of people, and then you see what you get. Very often, cults that do not openly endorse, you know, mass murder end up being involved in mass murder for the same reason, these same type of patterns. And I've repeatedly warned, again, if you, if you look at the history of any extreme political movement, people who are even members of the IRA, the Irish Independence Movement, Irish Republican Army, people who are members of the IRA, most of the time what they were afraid of was being murdered by other members of the IRA. The use of torture within the IRA, the use of torture on its own members, persecution, etc., is extreme. And again, many historical communist movement, communist, even tiny ones, I did research on one of the communist movements within Japan, the Red Army faction in Japan, you know, mostly young, university-educated people in Japan who formed a communist group, and, you know, they start murdering each other immediately. They start using, you know, violence and, and torture and so on uh, against one another. You know, they did kill some other people, too. That, that group was violent in many ways. But this is certainly a pattern you can see in, under many different headings in political science and in the, the study of religion. And honestly... Uh, veganism in the 21st century shares some elements of both. It shares some elements of being an extremist political movement and some elements of being a cult-like religious movement. And I can admit it, and I can I can address those problems because I want to learn from the past. I want to learn from history. I don't want to repeat the, the mistakes of history. I don't even want to repeat the mistakes from 2012 or 2001, much less from the last, uh, the last century. Anyway, I guess I will stop reading this article here. Um... Yeah, I mean, various other ironies of uh, Steve Best's mode of trying to intimidate Western academia into abolishing um, vivisection-based research are, are reflected on. And this, uh, the author, the anonymous author of this article, obviously has a long history of, of following the particular careers of the different uh, activists who are involved in this story. So, look, ultimately this video, like my channel, is about me. Um, I did not make this channel seeking a mass audience. I certainly never expected the adulation or support of thousands of people or tens of thousands of people. And it's a good thing. That's not what I'm looking for because that's, that's not what I'm going to get. Um, you know, I've said many times, this is not intro to Buddhism. This is not... <laughs> little slip there. It's also not intro to Buddhism. This is not intro to veganism. This is not veganism 101. Uh, this channel is really to provide meaningful discussions and hopefully eventually to instigate some meaningful 
organization and activism for people who are already advanced in veganism, people who have already heard it all before. And some of you watching this video have heard this all before, but for some of you it's really new. It's a new set of considerations. We have a problem with violence within veganism. We have a problem. Dur with Durian Ryder directly threatened me with violence and trying to kick me out of Thailand or send me to jail or whatever, and him defaming me and claiming I'm a white beard, etc. So you guys already know that. We have a problem with literally thousands of vegans claiming that I secretly work for the CIA, that I'm part of some conspiracy, um, on the basis of the notion that I'm pro-vivisection, that I'm a fake vegan because I'm allegedly pro-vivisection. That's a problem. That reflects many dark elements of human nature within veganism that are going to be very, very hard for us to overcome. Now, I don't accept, accept someone as vegan if they wear leather boots. I don't. I think there is a grounds to, in effect, kick someone out of your, your group of vegans. If you have someone who's willingly buying and wearing leather and calling themselves vegan, you say, look, I'm sorry, we got rules. You can't be part of the club if you're not willing to spend the time and make the effort to phase out leather in your life. This is, this is not negotiable. I would never kick someone out of the club because they rely on a medicine that was produced by research exploiting animals. I would never do that. Uh, the basic concept of veganism was, as, as you guys know, to do what's possible and practical. Um, I would never kick someone out because their grandmother is getting treatment for cancer. or It's just ridiculous. All the contradictions will let you because they, they've taken vaccines. Uh, anti-venom is another one. Okay, so you're bitten by a poisonous snake. Anti-venom, that's, you know, based on the exploitation of animals. You know, we've got to have the maturity to recognize the complexities of the situation we're in presently. But also the paradox we're drawn into. If we demand immediate change, if we make it like negotiation is over, like the, like the, like the, name of this ridiculous group implies. It, it's a total paradox as a tiny minority, a despised minority politically, that you demand either we have total social change meeting our ethical standards now or nothing. I, I would say the exact opposite of negotiation is over. It, it's not the case at all that negotiation is over. Negotiation has not even begun. Negotiation has not even begun yet. We're not in a negotiating position. We're nobody. We're nothing. We're just an idea on the internet. And a couple of crummy, do-nothing organizations, none of which is even as big as PETA, you know, none of which is as big as the Catholic Church, none of which is as influential as the Communist Party of China, even some other communist parties in Europe, you know, um, none, of, none of which is as, as big or influential as the Green Party in Germany. You know, some countries in Europe have, have very successful Green Parties, very successful ecological movements, um... We're really nobody and nothing. And you want to say negotiation is over and you're going to move straight to, to violent revolution. <laughs> it's, a, it's not a joke. Uh, sadly, it's, it's, it's deadly serious and it's ruining people's lives and has tremendously negative impacts around the world, um, even for vegans like me.